This is the Economic Club of Florida, a distinguished platform for discussion of the major national issues of the day. On today's program, former U.S. Senator Mel Martinez from Florida on the United States' place in the world. There are currents that have been present in American history over time, but not always the best ones. And I would describe them as nativism, protectionism, and isolationism. And uh, those have existed in our history, but are not always uh, the best thing for our country and for the world, particularly as it relates to trade, as it relates to our interaction with other countries. Good day, and welcome to the 521st in our series of Distinguished Speaker Programs. I'm Cindy O'Connell, Economic Club of Florida Club President. Today, we are privileged to have with us former U.S. Senator Mel Martinez. Welcome back to Tallahassee, Senator Martinez. Is this like almost like a homecoming for you? It is indeed. I'm delighted to be back in Tallahassee. I spent some of the, the best years of my life here as a student, so it's always fun to come back. Well, of those experiences, what, which one of those can you share with us real quick? You know, I really have to uh, talk about Ross Oglesby. Dr. Oglesby was a professor of mine and a mentor of mine, and he uh, inspired me to think that I was good enough to go to law school, where not for him, I never would have done it. And I really always have felt like he really played an immense role in my life, and I'm very grateful to him. Well, you know, having mentors is a very important part of what Florida State University does for so many of its young students. And what you're going to talk about today really is about changing and enhancing the lives of not only Floridians, but our world. Can you give us a snapshot of what you're going to share with us today? Well, we're going to be talking about the United States' place in the world, particularly as it relates to trade, as it relates to our interaction with other countries. And the consensus that we have understood for about 70 years in the post-World War II world is challenged and is changing and evolving and I think is a very important topic that we should delve on into and and then determine uh, we how we might feel about it because uh, there are currents that have been present in American history over time but not always the best ones and I would describe them as nativism protectionism and isolationism and uh, those have existed in our history but are not always uh, the best thing for our country and for the world that's absolutely true, and we're so excited to hear more from you. But to do a follow-up question, I want to introduce Ben Watkins, who's the chairman of the Economic Club of Florida, to do kind of a follow-up and close-out uh, of our discussion before your luncheon presentation. Thank you, Cindy. Senator Martinez, in reviewing your bio, the question that came to my mind is, over the course of your long and illustrious career, what accomplishment or what are you most proud of? Oh, man, that's a tough question. I know, because there are a lot of things. I, I did a lot of different things, and all had significance in their own moment in time. But I have to think, Ben, that being the first Cuban-American to ever sit in the cabinet of a president of the United States or be the first Cuban-American to walk onto the floor of the United States Senate as a United States senator, uh, those parallel each other pretty good. Mm -hmm. and, and I must say, in each of those instances, I looked around and thought, how in the world did I get here? How in the world did this happen? And you know, the answer to that is really rather simple. It's about the greatness of our country and our system and the opportunity that it gives us. And it all really materialized with a very fine education right here at Florida State University. But I think there's just an awful lot of pieces that come together in what is the fulfillment of an American dream. And that really, I think, goes back to who we are as a country and the opportunities that this country can afford us. Well, we're very fortunate to have you here. You're the guide star for the American dream <laughs> and uh, set an example for, for everyone, for not only those of us who are late in our careers, but more importantly, for those that are young in our career. And uh, thank you very much. And we appreciate your contribution and service to the country. Thank you. It means a lot. And now without further ado, I offer Senator Mel Martinez speaking before the Economic Club of Florida on some very important topics of our day. Well, thank you, Ben. Thank you very much to all of you. I'm, I'm honored to be with you, delighted to have a chance to see so many old friends. 
and obviously also to meet some new ones. Uh, delighted, Governor, that you're here. Appreciate that. And Bill Gunner was my senator when I was uh, a young guy in college. Uh, maybe, maybe grade school, Bill. I don't know. <laughs> Anyhow, but he, I was proud that he was my uh, my my Florida senator and. Uh, and a great public servant and always someone that I admire greatly, so it's really terrific to see so many good people that I've had a chance to interact with in different ways over the years. Um, Dom always kept me straight on how to save money and do things better, and so anyway, a lot of you have a connection, and I uh, appreciate so much some of you coming out and for a chance for us to say hello. Um, so, Ben, I appreciate your introduction a lot, and I obviously, uh, uh, my, my story, I, I should tell you, by the way, because part of my talk is about the United States' place in the world, and where are we today, and how is that evolving and transforming, and is it right, is it wrong, is it good, is it bad, and I'll let you draw the conclusions, but I'll give you my view on some things. But by the way, when you talk about my American dream and what I uh, happened in my life, there really are people who ought to be commended for that. Number one, my parents, who had the courage to send me away without them in the midst of a very difficult situation in Cuba at the time. But I also think, and I always have been incredibly grateful, to the foster family in the United States, in Florida, in Orlando, that took me into their home at the request of, of, uh, from the pulpit on Sunday that these young children, about whom they knew nothing, about whom you know, could not speak their language, uh, needed a place to stay. They didn't know for how long, but they did it. So when we talk about these currents that are in our country today of nativism, isolationism, and protectionism, we know that that is part of American history through our history, but we also know that it's not totally who we are as a people, and that we are a country that has always been ingrained by the influence and the opportunity that this country has always generated with immigrants. And so through different waves of people who have come to these shores, many of us have had the benefit and the opportunity to know what it is to live the American dream and hopefully help to pass it on to others. So my public service, to be honest with you, was always inspired by that. And that's why I'm always uh, a great believer that what this country has to offer is unique and the opportunities that we have to offer are also amazing. So, in the post-World War II world, there was a pretty good consensus that the United States would be engaged in the world, and that there was also a consensus that the world would be more peaceful and that the world would be more prosperous if we traded with one another with as few barriers as possible, and if we engaged with one another in a way that would avoid the possibility of misunderstanding and war. There's a great example of this, very specifically, in Europe. The European countries banded together, in part for their reconstruction in a post-war war day, for the destruction and the upheaval that had transpired. And so a lot of it had to do with wanting to be in a better place economically. But make no mistake about it, and if there's any clarification needed, Tony Blair provided it for me and not too, not, too far away, not too far back, which is that part of that genius was also to come together so that unlike their history for hundreds of years, Europe might live in peace. And for the last 70 years, the peace in Europe has been maintained. But just like in the United States, we have this little streak of isolationism and nativism and protectionism, the British people have also decided to leave the European Union. Now that's understandable in many ways, and the British people, the United Kingdom, can decide what and how they do it. But make no mistake about it that that is a little bit disruptive to this European unity that we've seen and has been such an important part of the world. So I only use that as an illustrative example, that as we look at where the United States is today and where we're going in the future, that our relationships abroad are tremendously important and they mean a great deal to us, and we've benefited economically greatly from it, not only from the opportunity to sell our goods and services to others, but we've also been a part of a very peaceful world, and I would dare say, in my personal case, with some humility, that maybe some of us immigrants who've come to our country have also made a contribution, certainly tried. And so, 
I don't want to depress you, okay? <laughs> it is Halloween, so maybe there is a... Uh, anyway, so let's just move on from Halloween. Uh, I went, to, I went to Bill's bookstore to buy t-shirts for my grandkids to take home for Halloween. <laughs> and the girl behind the counter, this cute little co-ed, and she said, what are you going to be for Halloween tonight? And I said, you know, I, I don't know. I think I'm a little old, okay? And she said, well, I, I mean, it's a big deal. He said, when your football team sucks, Halloween's a big deal. <laughs> <laughs> so, <laughs> anyway, so... Here's hoping we're not going to suck for very long. <laughs> anyway, uh, so let's talk about let's talk about USMCA, uh, the United States USMCA Mexico Canada Agreement. It used to be called MAFTA. Now we call it USMCA, and USMCA is an agreement between the United States, Canada, and Mexico that essentially modernizes and harmonizes with newer ideas of trade, that which was done in the early 90s, and which has been incredibly positive for the United States, but also for Mexico and for Canada. You know, by the way, one of the ways in which we can understand the great success of NAFTA over the years, in spite of the fact that we can hear how terrible it is, is the fact that our immigration problem is really not Mexico. In fact, vis-a-vis -vis Mexico, we have negative net migration. There's more people returning to Mexico than there are coming from Mexico in the last 10 years or so. And that's because Mexico has been reasonably prosperous. Our immigrant problem comes more from Central America and from other parts of the world and other places. But NAFTA has succeeded to the point that Mexico now has a, an emerging middle class and has an opportunity for their own citizens to do what they would more naturally do, which is stay home and get a job and support their families, than to immigrate and leave their families and not be able to return home. So in any event, the trade relationship between our nations has been a tremendous boon to us. And so the three-way trade uh, between Canada, Mexico, and the United States is 1.4 trillion last year. 1.4 trillion. I mean, I didn't take math at FSU that was good enough to know how many zeros that is, but that's a lot of them. So 1.4 trillion, trillion a year, or 3.8 billion daily. So each and every day, 3.8 billion dollars are being traded between these three countries. So now we have an agreement before the Congress. By the way, one third of all agricultural sales between the United States and the rest of the world go to these, three uh, these two countries. One third. So it needs modernizing. It has no provisions for e commerce when it was done. There wasn't a thought that e commerce was going to be a part of our world, and now it is, of course. It needs more IP protections, intellectual property, and it needs to also make sure that the labor rules are fair and that the United States uh, workforce can compete favorably with the Mexican workforce and so forth. So all of these things are good. So now this USMCA has been approved and it needs to be ratified by the Congress and it needs to go before the House and the Senate. Now this is so important that it is the number one priority of the United States Chamber of Commerce, the number one legislative priority of the Business Roundtable, and I would dare say the number one priority of a lot of other business groups in our country because it is that fundamental to an opportunity to continue to be uh, bringing jobs to our country as it has done over the years. It sits currently uh, in the Congress and it has to be approved by the House. Uh, the likelihood of its approval, you know Democrats, I'm a Republican but I'm not making a partisan statement. For a lot of reasons Democrats always have a little more trouble than Republicans, traditionally Republicans, with foreign trade agreements. And so it's a bit of a hard sell. It's a tough vote for a lot of Democrats because of the labor unions are not always consonant with it. But in this instance, I think there's a tremendous amount of support because the benefits are so obvious. On the Republican side, traditionally, we've been a party of trade and foreign, uh, foreign trade, and so uh, the current tendencies in the Republican Party are a little different than that. But nonetheless, there is a good likelihood that there would be enough votes in both houses to pass the USMCA and have it be signed by the president before the end of this year. There's some trouble in the horizon, though, because there's something, the I word is lurking. The I word means impeachment. And so 
a little tough to be thinking about legislative priorities of this magnitude and importance when we're really kind of sidetracked with this whole impeachment thing, good or bad. I'm not going to, you know, our, my talk today is not about impeachment. By the way, we're going to have Q&A later, so if you want to get into more saucy stuff, and I know a few of you are political and Barney's shaking his head, I'm happy to get into him in the Q&A session. But for now, let me, let me stick to that. I think there's a good likelihood that it could get approved, and a lot of forces are moving in that direction. Number one, the president needs an accomplishment. This would be a tremendous thing. Uh, the Baghdadi thing is a big deal, by the way. That's, I mean, not insignificant and worthy of credit, especially to our Delta Force, but also to the president who called the, made the call. It's a difficult call, just like President Obama did with, with um, uh, Osama bin Laden. But on the domestic front, it'd be nice to be able to show something. Uh, the same is for the House. If the House goes home to re-election and all they have to show for their efforts is impeachment, which ultimately is not going to pass in the Senate, what have you done? What have you done for me? How is my kitchen table uh, better today because of what you've done? And have you fulfilled your promises? Well, USMCA provides them something as well. I think the passage in the Senate is pretty well assured. But to the extent you influence friends and relations, it wouldn't be a bad thing for the USMCA to get approved, I believe, by this Congress. It would be a, I think it would be a great thing for, for all concerned. It certainly would be a great thing for job creation in our country. So the, the idea is that the Democrats could say, well, gosh, are we going to give the president this victory? Maybe we wouldn't want to do that. Uh, but at the same time, I think uh, Midwestern states like Michigan, Indiana, Ohio would benefit enormously from the continuation of uh, a lot of manufacturing that's now benefiting them, as well as the agricultural states. So it's a, it's a messy, complicated little political problem, but one that I hope will be resolved in what I think would be very good for our country. So while at it, I was also asked to talk a little bit about the region to the south. And uh, since I end up there a good bit and travel there some and have had a, an interest in it, I made some notes in the back of my more formal notes, which I, I know are here. Here we go. And basically, I just thought I'd do a little roundup of the region and uh, walk with me as we uh, head south. And I'll do that for a few more minutes, and then I'm going to really be delighted to take your questions and have an opportunity for us to engage in a little more dialogue than this monologue. So USMCA is key for our continued good relationship with Mexico, no question about that. Mexico is undergoing a little bit of a political transformation. We elect, or Mexico elected uh, Andres Lopez Obrador uh, now about a year ago, a year or so. Uh, he uh, was the former mayor of Mexico City, but he also had a history as a pretty good agitator from the left. Uh, since governing, he has been a bit more moderate than some of the worst fears were, but he also does have a lot of ideas that are counter to the way Mexico has been going. Mexico has been going in a way of more private enterprise, privatizing a lot of state entities and things of that nature which had worked very well for the Mexican economy. He is a little bit more on the, on the far left regions and uh, uh, does not have some of the same ideas that the immediately prior Mexican governments have had. So uh, close to, uh, important to keep a close eye on Mexico. They elect the president for one term. The term is six years and the president cannot be reelected. So he's just in the first couple of years of his term and it'll be, I mean, our relationship with Mexico is so important and obviously they do have a tremendous problem with the border region particularly in terms of drugs and whatnot and public safety. Uh, they got a lot of challenges and a lot of problems, uh, but they're such an important neighbor. And don't forget, we have a tremendous border with them. So their success really is our success, and their uh, stability is also of great benefit to us. But as we go south from there, we got Central America, and Central America is really a bit of a mess. Uh, Guatemala, Honduras, our uh, Salvador to some degree, our own uh, fail, uh, failed states or borderline failed states. Our immigration problems is coming from those areas particularly, uh, and it, they are a real problem in terms of gang violence and a whole lot of other difficult things and a real important lack of governance there. Uh, they are sort of democratic, uh, but there, there's never a lot, of, a lot of corruption in that area. So it's a lot of problems in the Central American region. They're small, but there are a lot of problems. Uh, the, the shining star of it all is Panama. You know, we, uh, 
uh, gave up on the canal many years ago, and that was roundly criticized by the time, and I probably did because, you know, it was free, right? You can always <laughs> criticize when something is done, and the one who does it gets the criticism. The fact of the matter is it's been a pretty good thing. Panama has done incredibly well. They're a democracy. They're stable. They're uh, really uh, enjoying a good bit of prosperity. And they've done not only a terrific job of running the canal, but they've also built a new, bigger one uh, that was a phenomenal project. And that seems to have been built on time, on budget, and be very, very productive. As we go south, we end up in Colombia. And Colombia has been, again, prosperous and good. We had, uh, when I was in the cabinet, it was, in, well, it started by Bill Clinton, continued by George W. Bush something called Plan Colombia, where we engaged with Colombia and gave them assistance, military assistance, to fight the narco-traffickers that were these crazy band of leftists that were a combination of narco-traffickers and leftist guerrilla movement that were destroying Colombia. We're destroying Colombia. And we worked with them on a bipartisan basis year after year. I did when I was in the cabinet to the extent that I could influence things. And, uh, you know, I was kind of a roving ambassador for Latin America because I was the only Spanish-speaking person in the cabinet. And so I ended up uh, getting sent on some missions and whatnot. It was very interesting, and I enjoyed it a lot. And it was, I think, productive. And so we had a very close partnership with Colombia in trying to fight uh, and root out all of these bad elements that were there. Very successful. Ended up in such success that Colombia is now a great story, stable democracy. Uh, rule of law prevails. It's become a tourist destination in many ways. I mean, uh, my, my uh, oldest son and his wife have been to Cartagena for, for vacation. Back in the old days, Nat and I used to work with Colombia back before it was un not peaceful. And it's amazing the, 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 the evolution and the turnaround. But they have a challenge, and the challenge is at their border with Venezuela. They've taken in three million refugees in the last three years from Venezuela. Venezuela is a failed state. Venezuela, you, you've read enough about Venezuela in the news. I'm not going to bore you with it. But we're essentially at a stalemate between Maduro and Guaido. And essentially, it's a bit of a foreign policy failure for our country that we have not been able to move that situation to a better place. Not that it's our responsibility, but it is in our backyard. And it is important that what is bad about Venezuela doesn't inflict more uh, instability into Colombia because three million refugees to a country of 40 million people, that's a big problem. And so I'm hopeful that Colombia can get through this and not be, uh, <coughs> excuse me, not further disrupted by, by that situation. Uh, so I'll leave Venezuela alone because we know that's a mess. <laughs> and you've read about it. Uh, but if we move on south, uh, Argentina has Bolsonaro as president. He is a a typical president, interesting guy, but very much from the right. <coughs> and, you know, the problem with Brazil is that there are 50% of the economy of Latin America is in Brazil, and they have not been doing well. And part of it is because they've made some governance mistakes in having a very, uh, very left leaning government uh, through two particular governments and with a lot of corruption, and that ended up putting them in economic trouble. So the recovery of Brazil is an important consideration and one that would be important for the region and for us. Uh, beyond Brazil, uh, Argentina just had an election. Four years ago, they elected a very good president who was doing all of the things that are necessary to be done in order to bring the country into a better economic situation, pay the debt, lower the debt. Dom, you love it. Uh, president Macri did everything right. And I remember being down there, and we were so excited about what all was happening in, in Argentina. And my Argentinian friends that work with us at J.P. Morgan were saying, and I hope things economically turn around fast enough so that he can get reelected. <laughs> well, guess what? They didn't. And so last Sunday, we elected, uh, the Argentinians elected uh, Alberto Fernandez, and his vice president is Cristina Fernandez Kirchner. I guess it was a shortage of Fernandez's outside government, so now we have two, vice president and president of both Fernandez. And Christina Kirchner was the immediate past president before Mr. Macri, and incredibly corrupt, incredibly leftist, a big ally of Venezuela's, and nothing much good there. President Bush sent me to the uh, transfer of power when her husband, 
uh, Nestor Kishner was elected to office in 2002, I think it was, and uh, then he uh, died of a heart attack. She runs for his job, and she, he was bad, but she was a lot worse than he was. <laughs> and so anyway, and then the picture of stability in South America, two weeks ago, three weeks ago, I would have been telling you, boy, go to Chile. What a great country, peaceful, tranquil, good economy, everything is great. Well, guess what? The last two weeks have been nothing but hell. The streets are mobbed by people. A tremendous populist wave. Uh, they were going to be hosting the um, um, uh, Asian Pacific Conference. The APAC conference was to take place in Chile. In fact, President Bush was to be meeting with Xi Jinping to talk about initial trade deals and whatnot. And this morning or yesterday, the President of Chile had to cancel hosting the meeting because things are so, so disruptive and so violent. And both, I think, in Argentina's case and I think also in Chile's case, we see this populist movement, this wave of populism that is uh, really, I think, eroding uh, a lot of democratic values. Now, uh, there's a place for populism, but I'm afraid uh, too much of it, uh, particularly in fragile democracies, can be a very bad thing. So now for the fun part of the talk. Okay, <laughs> I forgot that part. So it's all bad, I'm sorry. <laughs> Washington is a hot mess and Latin America is not much better. Uh, <laughs> But I think FSU is going to beat Miami Saturday, so maybe, <laughs> so maybe that young lady doesn't have to rely on Halloween for her fun. So anyway, <laughs> with that, let me open it up to your questions, and uh, I'd be delighted to try to talk about other topics too, if you're interested, and uh, whatever, whatever comes your way. So, take it away. Senator, will there be a yep, Dom. Oh, shy guy over here. Dom had the first question. Senator, um, thank you for your incredible service to the. Thank you. Both nationally and in, in, in the state of Florida and Orlando and so forth. Um, what might be three or four things that you think we could do as anti oxidants if you will, against the corruption tax, as you kind of said? Uh, to fight corruption, what are the kind of things, rule of law, constitutional? Reform? You mean abroad? Yeah. Abroad. Yeah. yeah. Oh, the, the big problem, the big problem right along in all of the above is rule of law. I think an independent judiciary is essential. And having uh, transparency in that regard, I think, makes all the difference in the world. And I think all of the problems I'm talking about would be benefited by more fighting on corruption. I think, well, we do some of it. We do, uh, you know, foreign aid is not given to countries unless they meet cert certain guidelines and certain standards. A lot of them can't, and that's a problem. Uh, so I think, you know, it's really, really an important consideration, something that as we interact with other countries, we need to always be striving to, uh, to, to, to encourage. I'm on the board of the National Endowment for Democracy, which is a wonderful organization and does a lot of good. And has, it was created on the Ronald Reagan area, era. And it was particularly focused on helping create democracies in the Eastern European world after the fall of the Soviet Union. Uh, it does much more than that, and it works all over the world, promoting democracy and human rights. But building institutions of democracy are also terribly important. An election is just a manifestation of democracy, but it's not democracy. Democracy is the economic club in Tallahassee. It is Dom Calabria doing the things that he does in his organization. It is all of the above. The working together keeps politicians honest, creates environments and atmospherics and, 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 and good research so that folks can then react to that in a democratic way on when the, day, the day they go vote and they're an informed voter. All of these things have to work together. And so these immature democracies really need corruption fighting and development of institutions of democracy along the same lines. But, you know, political parties, the whole works. Barney. Uh, Senator, um, you talked about South America and things were going around. Uh, Peru is having problems, so is Bolivia yeah. as well. So I have a two-part question. Number one, what kind of advice, uh, not asking for you know, any confidential information, but what kind of advice and counsel do you provide to the senior leadership of J.P. Morgan Chase about doing business uh, in South America and in Central America. And then the one place that I think many of us are very interested in, particularly since you were born there, is Cuba. And what do you think is the future there? Okay. Uh, and, for, and I'm talking about the future for American business. Yeah. Obviously, probably after the next regime goes by. And right. Get some, get some. So, uh, I mean, look, I, I think JP Morgan is a worldwide bank. We've had a presence in Latin America for 100. 50 years, and we're going to continue to be there. 
Uh, it's unfortunate that sometimes the climate isn't good. We don't do business in Venezuela. The whole time I went out and I wanted to work for J.P. Morgan, I said, look, I'll, I'll be glad to help in Latin America, but I'm not going to Venezuela. I don't think it'd be a good for my health. And, uh, you know, closely that line with Cuba, you know. Anyway, and they said, no, don't worry about it, because we're not doing, we're trying to, whatever little business we have left in Venezuela, we're trying to end it. So you can't do business in certain environments, but Argentina is a country where we have a huge, we have two, 3,000 people that work there. It's a regional hub for us, tremendously important. So whether a government is left-leaning, right-leaning, good or bad, we're still going to be there, and we need to be there. Uh, so we work around the world, and we're going to continue to do that. In terms of Cuba, uh, you know, the United States did a lot in the Obama administration to change our relationship with Cuba. There was an unfortunate situation is that Cuba did not reciprocate. Cuba did not open up. Cuba today is not like Vietnam. Cuba today is not like China. Cuba today is more like North Korea. So it's very difficult to engage when your dance partner is not engaging back in a way that's useful, that is helpful, and that is conducive to better economic ties. So it really is going to be a time when Cuba has a different government than it does today. Uh, and I think the time, they're, they're in a process of transition down there, and they're trying, they just got to figure it out. I mean, it's not, it's not rocket science what they need to do in terms of a banking system, in terms of a stable uh, single currency. They have two currencies. I mean, there's a lot of stupid things they do. Doing business in Cuba seemed like a panacea to a lot of people. When people looked hard at it, during the Obama years, before things retrenched a bit, it wasn't a good business decision. And it's not China. There's not like a billion people, customer base there. It's an 11 million impoverished people with no spending power. Rules of the game are not particularly favorable. So you gotta have a rule of law, you gotta have banking. There's a lot of things that they just haven't, you know, come back to do, so. Question, oh, over here, sorry. a lot of talk about the Mexico South American side. I thought that there was a C in there somewhere of capital. Is the Canadian portion of that so good it's not controversial? And is the problems, uh, I understand the Prime Minister may be having a few problems too yeah. with it being solved? The Canadian side is not controversial. You know, we have a huge border with Canada, but nobody talks about we have a problem in the Canadian border, you know. And so. There's a little bit of a discrepancy there. I think there's no real controversy on either side of the agreement, quite honestly. Canada's just an easier sell, you know? I mean, that's just right. They don't have the drug problem that Mexico has. They don't have a lot of the headlines that you might read about Mexico that are not pleasant. Uh, but no, I think, I think, honestly, I don't think there's a real controversy about the substance of it. I think it makes sense in all regards. I think it's just the politics of it. You know, it really is about that. I mean, amazing. This is a problem in Washington, and the politics have something to do with it. So anyway, yeah, yeah. there's gambling in Casablanca, too. Anyway. <laughs> yes. So, uh, the overwhelming majority of the trade occurring in Florida is with our partners in Central and South America. I'm curious what concerns you might have relative to the presence of China in some of those countries, whether it's from a uh, investment standpoint, they're looking at getting very involved in a lot of key infrastructure in some of these countries. And, you know, obviously with the strain that we have with China right now, you don't want that carrying over to some of our tremendous partners to the south. So curious if you have any thoughts on, on some of that influence that's coming with those dollars and those investments. That's an excellent question and one that has worried some of us that concern ourselves with the region back when I was in government even. Uh, China has been on a very, very aggressive investment and trade uh, pattern with the whole region for many years. Uh, and they've made tremendous inroads. And in some countries in Latin America, they're the number one trading partner where historically and traditionally we have been. They have displaced us. Uh, they make tremendous investments and they're not concerned, as I was saying to Dom about corruption, they don't care. You just let us have access to your mining or your oil or whatever, and we don't care what you do. We don't care what happens here, because they don't much care for about democracy or rule of law or any of that. And so they're a tremendous competitor. And I would say, by the way, not only in Central and South America, but also in the Pacific region. And um, that's why the, you know, the, the Pacific Trade Agreement that uh, TPC 
trade, uh, you know, that was uh, touted during the last election cycle as being terrible to the point that Hillary Clinton, who had been a promoter of it, became, an, uh, you know, against it. That was just wrongheaded. It was really dumb because it had a twofold benefit to our country. Number one, it was good for trade. It brought in Chile, Mexico into trading partnership, Peru, trading partnerships with the Pacific region and Asian countries. It brought together from Australia all the way to the Philippines and Japan into a partnership of trade. And guess what the biggest political benefit of it was? It was a checkmate towards China, you know? And we walked away from that. It was a tremendous mistake. We need to get back to that. It's tremendously important that we provide a check on Chinese expansion and Chinese economic and otherwise interest in the world in a way that isn't really healthy for us. They're doing it as a competitor to us. So you ask an escalating question, it's a real problem, it's something that's been happening now for years, and it's something about which we're not responding particularly well or aggressively. And as we retrench from the world, there's a few beneficiaries. One is China, another one in the Middle East is Russia. And I realize that we don't want to be in endless wars, and I understand completely. However, we're leaving a heck of a vacuum in places, and when you leave a vacuum, you know, leadership abhors a vacuum, and someone else is going to step in and provide leadership that sometimes you may not like or agree with the leadership they're providing. So that's, that's a real challenge. So one part is, from your experience with the Women Bank, I'm sorry? How did you, uh, so from your experience working at the Global Bank, what was the uh, your perception of exodus of companies from New York coming down south um, here at the border? That's one. And also, I'd like to hear the story about how you went from Captain Kai's secretary to writing for the US. Oh, wow. Okay. Well, the second story is more interesting, so I'll, I'll deal with that first. <laughs> I was um, at a time, <laughs> this is really a funny story. Uh, in July of, let's see, I ran for the Senate in 2004, so in July of 2003, Carl Rove invited me to the White House. And he said, you know, there's a Senate race in Florida. We really think you should run. I know he was thinking of, you know, it'd be great if you brought out Hispanic voters to vote for Bush for re-election, but in addition to that, you'd be a great senator, and we really think the world of you and all of that. And I said, you know, I, I don't want to run for the Senate. I'm not running against Bob Graham, basically, is what I was thinking, you know. Well, Carl wasn't used to people saying no to him, particularly about running for an office. And so he wasn't happy with me about that. But that was that, and we moved on. And uh, fast forward now to November, and President Bush and President Putin had had a summit meeting. And at that summit meeting, they decided, this was in friendlier days, <laughs> Uh, back when he looked into his eyes and all of that, <laughs> anyway. <laughs> it's a little bit like Kim Jong-un's love letters or whatever, you know, but anyway. <laughs> and so uh, one of the areas of cooperation was in housing. And so he was going to send me, he asked me to go to Russia to talk about housing and how we do our public housing and all that kind of stuff. And so anyway, I, I went with a delegation of housing people to Russia. And I'm honest to goodness having dinner in St. Petersburg with our traveling group and my chief of staff leaves the room, comes back on his cell phone, he said, I got the White House on the phone. And I go, oh wow, I don't have the nuclear codes, I'm not sure what they're calling me, but anyway. <laughs> now, so anyhow, uh, it, was, it was the White House uh, political office asking me, uh, uh, is there media here? I never told this in public, but anyway. <laughs> oh well, there it goes. It's not going to be on my podcast. Uh, I'm sorry. I'm, I'm just not doing this You're doing formally. You're sorry, doing Cindy. Great. Anyway, so I, uh, I talked to them and they said, well, you really need to come back. Bob Graham is, is retiring and he's not running for re-election and we really think you should run. Guess what I didn't do? Big mistake was call the governor of Florida, my friend Jay Bush, and say, hey Jeb, what do you think? <laughs> well, that was a mistake because he wasn't happy about me just deciding to run. But anyway, I came back, cut the trip short, came back and uh, had a long meeting at the White House, had a long meeting with Bill Frist, who was at the time the um, Republican leader of the Senate, majority leader, I think, at the time. Rick Santorum, senator from Pennsylvania, was in charge of recruiting for the Senate. Bill uh, 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 Allen from Virginia, Senator Allen, was also in the recruiting. So anyway, they just 
were at me to run. And uh, so I spent about two weeks thinking about it. And I, you know, the proverbial yellow pad with the do's and don'ts or yeses or no's or why's or why nots. And I ultimately decided that I should do it. And, um, you know, I've been in the cabinet for three years and I had done a lot at HUD and 9-11 happened while I was there. So I had to be involved in the reconstruction of lower Manhattan and a lot of good things. But I also thought that if I could win the Senate race in Florida, that would be a pretty neat thing to do. And serving in the Senate, at the time I thought I'd enjoy it a little more than I did, but anyway, uh, and make a contribution, and so I, I decided to run. And uh, as I say, the rest is kind of history. It was, uh, running statewide in Florida is the closest thing to a presidential election you can have. And I, I mean, all of you are familiar enough with Florida politics to know the complexities of that. Uh, but, you know, I, I raised, I think, something in the order of 20-some million dollars. Uh, today, a Senate race in Florida, what did, what did Rick Scott spend last time? Uh, over 100, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. So it, the price is going up. The job doesn't pay anymore, <laughs> but the price of getting in is going up. So anyway, well, I think my time is up, and thank you very much for having me. Thank you. Thank you. Please, please thank uh, Senator Martinez. You've been listening to Mel Martinez, former U.S. Senator from Florida, speaking before the Economic Club of Florida on October 31st, 2019 in Tallahassee, Florida. The Economic Club of Florida promotes interest and enlightenment on important economic, political, and social issues of the day. To learn more, including how to become a member, visit our website at economic-club.com. This program was recorded at the Florida State University Alumni Center in Tallahassee, Florida.